Hello, welcome to Mystery Science. Today we're going to be looking at momentum. Now this fits in with our Edexcel CP2 forces unit. Now this also fits with Edexcel single science and physics, but I'm sure also that it fits in with other exam boards at the moment. We're going to be looking at what momentum is, how do we describe momentum, uh, what does it do, and we're going to be looking at the factors that affect it. What is it and how do we calculate it? We're then going to be able to calculate momentum for a bunch of different objects. And then we're going to look at the forces involved in momentum and how, in fact, we can calculate forces. And we'll have another quick look at Newton's second law. We're also going to have a very brief look about how to calculate uh, momentum in collisions, but more probably bleed that into the next video. I think this one's going to be uh, a pretty long one. Right, so our normal uh, standard procedure then, is do the do now, state Newton's third law, that's from the last video, and also how are action reaction for pairs different to balance forces. All of this stuff uh, would have been in the last video. Um, make sure that you're watching this uh, as part of the playlist. I'll link it uh, up there. Uh, so that you can see all of these videos in order. Okay, so what is Newton's third law? Well, Newton's third law, put very simply, is that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. If I push against a wall, the wall's going to push back on me. Now, the simplest way uh, of testing this is to stand on a skateboard uh, with a mate who's also on a skateboard, stand right next to each other and then just push on each other. Both of you will move backwards because uh, as you uh, push on your friend and your friend pushes on you, you're both going to move in the opposite direction to your force because of the opposite reaction force. Now you don't even both need to push. If you stand, uh, both of you on a skateboard and you push your friend in the back, both of you will move off. Uh, your friend will move in the direction you've pushed him and you will move off in the opposite direction. Now, Newton's third law is the reason that it's very difficult to get on a boat. If you try and step onto a boat from a fixed jetty and the boat is bobbing along on the water, as soon as you step on this boat, there is an equal and opposite reaction force and the boat wants to move this way, uh, leaving you uh, with one foot on the boat, one foot on the jetty, and that comedy moment where all of a sudden there's nothing beneath you except the water. Splash. Okay, how are action reaction pairs different to balanced forces? Now, this is all about language, but it's also all about uh, thinking about the bodies. If you have a balanced force uh, that Newton's first law is talking about, then the body is one thing. I am sat on the chair, the force of me. Uh, on the chair, the force uh, of the chair on me, that's a pair action-reaction action pair. Now, uh, so balance forces act upon a single object where action-reaction pairs act on completely different objects. Uh, me pushing on the wall, the wall pushing back on me. Whereas with a balanced force, then it's all about either the forces on the wall or the forces on me. All right, cool. So what is momentum then? Well, put simply, momentum is how difficult it is to stop something. It is a measure of motion, but it's a measure of the difficulty to make something stop. Now, I say put simply, but huh, let's look at an example, and that might help. Here, I've got a scooter. Now, my little scooter is 110 kilograms. It's a real mess. I looked it up. And here is a whacking great monster truck. Now, the whacking great monster truck, its mass is six tons, 6,000 kilograms. That's a bit of a difference. 6,000 kilograms versus 110 kilograms. Now, if both of the scooter and the monster truck go off at exactly the same velocity, let's pretend for a moment their acceleration is equal, their velocity is equal at all times, 
which one's going to be the hardest to stop? The scooter, weighing 110 kilograms, or the whacking great monster truck at 6,000 kilograms? Well, let's not just uh, leave it to our imaginations. Let's ask Bob. Now, Bob, unfortunately, he's not happy about this experiment, and I'm not entirely sure why. But let's see what happens. So the scooter and the monster truck are going to move off at exactly the same time, and they're both going to stop and not hit Bob. Oh, here we go. Ah, oh dear, Bob is dead. Uh, and that's because it was harder to stop the monster truck. So the monster truck didn't stop in time. And we're going to talk about stopping distances in the next lesson, but I'm just going to pop off and call Bob's family. Okay, so moving on, uh, what I'd like you to do is write a definition of momentum, please. And rather than try and remember uh, anything from that unfortunate incident, I've left you a little closed passage here uh, for you to fill in. And you can use these keywords, vector, stop, momentum, velocity, moving, and object. Pause the video, write all that down, and then we'll come back. Right, welcome back. So momentum is a measure of the tendency of an object to stop moving, i.e. how hard it is to stop it moving. If you've got something massive and it's moving slowly, it's still hard to stop because it's massive. Whereas if you've got something small, if it's traveling really, really quickly, it's still difficult to stop like a bullet. So momentum, uh, of an object depends very much on its mass and its velocity. And because velocity is a vector quantity, it's no surprise then that momentum is also a vector quantity. It depends on both the size and the direction uh, of the momentum. It's easier to stop something in one direction uh, if it's momentum, it's going in a different direction. So we have another simple relationship just like force, mass, and acceleration. Now we have another three term uh, formula, momentum equals mass times velocity. So we can use this three term formula triangle. Now, I'm not a great fan of formula triangles, but some of you have started to request them in my videos. So here we go. Uh, momentum sits at the top because momentum equals mass times velocity. So if you want to calculate momentum, you do mass times velocity. If you want to do calculate velocity, do momentum divided by mass. And if you want to calculate mass, you do momentum divided by velocity. And we use the symbols P for momentum um, because we don't want to confuse it with M for mass. We use an M for mass in many other things. And V is velocity. So we use P for momentum. All right, so here is an example question. A Peugeot 206 has a mass of 910 kilograms. Again, I've looked it up. What is its momentum if it's traveling at a velocity of 40 meters per second? You know what we're gonna do? We're gonna do a bit of s row. First, E, you write our equation. P equals mv, momentum equals mass times velocity. Then we substitute in the numbers. P is equal to 910 kilograms multiplied by 40 meters per second. Do we need to rearrange that? Nope, the subject is the unknown. So we have P equals 910 times 40. So we work that out. We end up with a momentum of 36,400. What are the units? Well, it's 36,400 kilograms meters per second. So I have been reliably informed that in my last video, uh, I named this car incorrectly. I pronounced it Bugatti Chiron. It is, in fact, a Bugatti Chiron, uh, Jeremy Clarkson told me himself. So the Bugatti Chiron has a mass of 2,000 kilograms. Again, true, I looked it up. What is its momentum at 89 meters per second? That's roughly 200 miles an hour. So let's have a look. Again, we have to use SRAM. So E, what's our equation? P equals MV, momentum is mass times velocity. S, 
substitute in the numbers, momentum is 2,000 multiplied by 89. Do I need to rearrange? Nope, no I don't. Uh, momentum is still equal to 2,000 times 89. So what's the answer? We have a whopping 178,000. Again, 178,000 kilograms meters per second. Right, here are some practice questions for you. What I'd like you to do, pause the video and have a go at these. A motorbike is traveling at 25 meters per second and has a mass of 220 kilograms. Please calculate the momentum. And then a car is moving east with a velocity of 50 meters per second and a mass of 3,070 kilograms. Calculate the momentum of the car. And then can you please explain why a motorbike and a car traveling at the same velocity have different levels of momentum. Pause the video and we'll come back in a second. All right, welcome back. Uh, if you could mark your answers in a green pen uh, and make any corrections needed. Also, if you've got something wrong, try and make sure you can get to the correct answer. So our motorbike uh, has a momentum of 5,500 kilograms meters per second whereas the car has a momentum of 46,050 kilogram meters per second. So you can see there's a big difference on the mass. Now, the reason they'd have completely different momentums is because the car has a greater mass and therefore a greater level of momentum. So the mass and the velocity play an important part. But remember that when you're on the road, if you're driving uh, at the speed limit on a 30 mile an hour road, your momentum is only dependent on your mass because everyone's going at the same velocity, assuming they're going at the maximum speed limit. The same on a motorway where everybody is going at uh, 70 miles an hour. So if everybody's going at 70 miles an hour, if you get hit by a car, it has a lower momentum than the truck. Both of those are going to squash you, but obviously, the truck is going to be harder to stop. Cars can stop an awful lot shorter distances uh, than huge trucks because of the mass. And again, we'll talk about that more in the next lesson. All right, back to my Peugeot 206. Still got a mass of 910 kilograms, but its momentum is now traveling at 36,000 kilograms meters per second. Can you work out its velocity? So we're going to do some more s round. So our equation is still P equals mv. Momentum is mass times velocity. We substitute in those numbers. We know the momentum, 36,000, is equal to the mass, 910 kilograms, multiplied by the unknown velocity. So is the unknown the subject of the equation? Well, no, it's not. So we have to rearrange to get v uh, as a subject of the equation, I have to divide both sides by 910. So V, the velocity, is 36,000 divided by 910, which gives me a cool 39.56. So our answer for this then is 39.6 meters per second if we round to the nearest de first decimal place. All right, so here is another Bugatti. This time it's a Veyron and it's got a velocity of 80 meters per second and it's got a momentum of a whopping 151,040 kilograms meters per second. Can you calculate uh, its mass? Let's s row. So we start out writing out our equation p equals mv same as before and substitute in what we know. The momentum is 151,040 which equals mass times 80 meters per second. Is uh, the unknown the subject of the equation? No, it isn't. So to get m uh, on its own, we have to divide both sides by 80. So now we have 151,040 divided by 80, which gives us uh, 1,888 or 1,888 kilograms. Again, the actual weight of the Bugatti Veyron, I check. Okay, so here's another couple of practice questions for you. A motorbike has a momentum of 2,860 kilograms meters per second 
and has a mass of 220 kilograms. Uh, what's its velocity? How fast is it going? A car is moving east with a velocity of 15 meters per second and now has a momentum of 40,000 kilograms per meters per second. Calculate the mass of the car. Pause the video, have a go at those. Right, welcome back. So answer number one, the motorbike is traveling at 13 meters per second, which is a shade under 30 miles an hour. Well done. The car uh, now has a mass of 2,667 kilograms. Let me know how you got on. Okay, so now let's have a look at Newton's second law again. Newton's second law says that force is proportional to acceleration, where the gradient of the graph produced the force against acceleration is the mass. Um, so let's have a look at that equation, force equals mass times acceleration. Now, we know from previous work that the acceleration is the change in velocity, which is the final velocity minus the initial velocity divided by the time taken to change velocity. That's the acceleration, it's a change in velocity over time. Now, so force times acceleration, uh, sorry, force is now mass times acceleration, where acceleration is V minus U over T. So I can say that force is mass times that expression of acceleration, V minus U over T. Now I can multiply out those brackets so that I now have force equals to MV minus MU divided by T. What is MV? Mass times velocity. Well, that's momentum. So now I have the force being related to the change in momentum over time. Now that is actually the real Newton's second law, but we've jiggled it backwards to make it force equals mass times acceleration. So the force is related to a change in momentum. All right, so let's look at an example to show you what I mean. If I've got a two ton car, 2000 kilograms, accelerating from 10 meters per second to 25 meters per second in 10 seconds, what resultant force is produced from that acceleration? So what force do I need to cause that acceleration? So we know that force is mv minus mu over t, the change in momentum over time. So now my force is the momentum of the final uh, state of the car. So 2000 times 25, its mass times its uh, velocity and its initial momentum, 2000 multiplied by 10, all divided by 10 seconds. So my force is 50,000 minus 20,000 divided by 10, which gives me a force of 3000 newtons. That's the force required to accelerate that car from 10 meters per second to 25 meters per second in 10 seconds. All right, now it's your turn. This smart looking Nissan here apparently weighs about a thousand kilograms. I haven't actually looked that one up. So this a thousand kilogram car accelerates from rest to 15 meters per second in 15 seconds. What is the resultant force that could have caused this? Pause the video, work that out and come back when you're done. Right, welcome back. So a thousand kilogram car accelerates from rest to 15 meters per second in 15 seconds. So we do our ERSAL. Uh, we start with the equation, uh, force is equal to mv minus mu over t. So our final velocity is 15 meters per second. Our mass is 1,000 kilograms. And our initial velocity is rest, so it's zero. So we substitute all the numbers in. We don't need to rearrange, but we can get rid of that 1,000 times zero to be 15,000 divided minus zero, which is just 15,000 divided by 15. And that gives us a force of 1,000 newtons. Right, we've now got to that point where we're going to have a brief look at collisions. And again, it's going to be a brief look because we're going to go through this in a bit more detail in the next lesson. But moving objects that come across 
another moving object will collide. The total momentum of both the objects is the same before the collision as it is after the collision. This is called conservation of momentum. I'd like you to try and give a better explanation in your book what conservation of momentum is. I want your own description in your own words. But essentially what we're looking at is the total momentum before a crash has to equal the total uh, momentum after the crash. The momentum is the same before and after. Nothing changes about the momentum. So here's an example. We've got two penguins uh, on an icy lake. Uh, Edwin the penguin slides along at six meters per second and bumps into his mate who is standing very still. So after this collision they both move off. Now Edwin's friend is the same mass as Edwin. They're both 20 kilograms. So when they collide, the momentum is the same and they move off together as one body. Uh, so this means this one body has 40 kilograms. So because of the conservation of momentum, the total momentum before the collision is the same as the total momentum after the collision. So the total momentum before the collision in this case is 6 times 20, is it's 20 kilograms multiplied by 6 meters per square per second. And you have to add that to the momentum of the second penguin, but he's not moving. So his momentum is zero because 20 times zero is zero. So the total momentum before the collision is 20 times six. So the momentum after the collision has to be exactly the same. But now I've got uh, 40 kilograms as the mass of my object. Um, so the total momentum after the collision has to be the same as it was before. 20 times 6 is 120 uh, kilograms meters per second. So our 120 kilograms meters per second divided by 40 gives a velocity of 3 meters per second. So now we have conservation of momentum. The momentum is the same before the collision and after the collision. We'll go through a couple more examples later. OK, so here is an exam question uh, that I'd like you to try and attempt. And I say attempt because this one's quite hard, but I think you can do this and I think you're going to be fine. This is a Newton's cradle. When the ball's lifted at the end uh, and allowed to hit the others, uh, this happens. The balls in the middle, the three balls in the middle, don't move. They stay where they are. And the one at the other end then flies off at the same velocity as the first ball uh, hit them. And they'll do this for some time. Now, the only thing that actually stops these uh, in real life is air resistance. If you took these into space where there was no air, uh, these would just go on and on and on, which is pretty amazing. If you could, could you please try and use conservation of momentum to explain what's going on here? And I'll show you a model example uh, when you come back. OK, for a four mark question, uh, this is one of those where if you simply list everything that you know uh, about conservation of momentum, you're probably going to hit all four of these marks. So the conservation of momentum says that the total momentum of the system is equal to the mass of the moving ball multiplied by its velocity because nothing else is moving. So the whole momentum uh, at the beginning of before there's a collision is just of the momentum of that moving ball. Everything else is stopped. Uh, the total momentum of the system afterwards is equal to the initial momentum. That's the conservation of momentum law. Okay? So we've got two marks just by describing uh, conservation of momentum. So the process in the middle, as it hits the line of balls, it trans 
fares the momentum and comes to a stop. All of the momentum is transferred along the line of balls to the ball at the end. Uh, so the middle balls don't move because all of that momentum just gets shuffled along. And then the final ball has got the same momentum as the first ball. So it moves off with the same velocity. And this is assuming, of course, that all the balls have the same mass. And so that goes on and on and on because the total momentum in the system never changes. Right, I'm bored of teaching and explaining things, uh, so I want you to do it. Uh, what I want you to do is write down uh, an explanation for momentum for someone who's got absolutely no idea about it. Now you do know about momentum, I want you to tell them about it. And then I want you to ask them three questions to test their knowledge to make sure they've understood. Kind of like what we do in the classroom. Right, next lesson, we're going to talk about stopping distances and car crashes, which is always fun to talk about. So until then, stay safe. I'll see you soon.